yeah, absolutely. Um, so hi everybody, thank you for, for joining us um, for today's Science in the News seminar. Um, today we have Daniel Richard as our speaker. And uh, Daniel is originally from Toronto, Canada, and he completed his bachelor's degree at the University of Waterloo. Um, he's now a six year PhD student in the Human Evolutionary Biology Program, and um, he works in the lab of Terence Cappellini. Um, Daniel studies uh, how human traits such as uh, osteoarthritis risk and height um, might be evolving over time. Uh, and today he's going to uh, talk to us about um, different influences that are uh, shaping human evolution. Uh, so we're very excited to hear your talk, Daniel, and uh, take it away. Fantastic. Thank you, Jacqueline. Uh, so hi, everyone. Uh, today, I would uh, like to give my talk titled Survival of the Quickest, How Climate Change Has Shaped Human Evolution. Uh, and so sort of the motivation uh, talking about uh, this uh, topic, uh, focusing on sort of this idea of climate change and species loss. And so the key points that I want to uh, discuss with you uh, in this talk are firstly, uh, where do species come from? Uh, that is, a, yeah, how do species um, evolve and what particularly drives species to evolve? Uh, and then finally, sort of in this vein of thinking about um, climate change and how it sort of uh, pushes species, um, what happens if species can't evolve quickly enough? Uh, and so the format of this talk, uh, it will be in three parts. Um, firstly, I'll go over a history of sort of uh, the theory of natural selection, as well as key concepts in understanding how natural selection works. Um, we'll then be uh, talking about evolution, uh, adaptation, and sort of uh, how changing environments uh, pushes animals to evolve. Uh, and then finally, in that vein of thinking about um, changing environments, talking about the effects of rapid climate change and how that leads to extinctions. Uh, and then talking about sort of rapid climate change uh, induced by human activities, uh, the so-called anth Anthropocene, uh, which I'll define a bit later in this talk. And so uh, first moving into this first section. Um, now, thinking about uh, sort of evolutionary theory uh, before Darwin entered the scene, uh, before Darwin's time, people knew that organisms we see today are not the same as those that existed in the past. For example, they knew that dinosaurs existed in the distant past because they found and studied fossils. However, the question was A, where those animals went, and B, where new animals came from. While there were a handful of theories tossed out at the time, none of them really answered these fundamental questions in a complete way. Uh, that is, until one particularly well-known man entered the scene. Uh, Charles Darwin was an English naturalist who studied biology, chemistry, and zoology in the early 1800s. Uh, in his early 20s, he had the fantastic opportunity uh, to board um, an expedition ship uh, called the HMS Beagle, um, and he went on an expedition, sort of a, a tour of South America, uh, stopping in at various locations as they sort of um, went around uh, the lower half of South America. And every time the ship sort of stopped, he was able to row out to the land and sort of survey things. As a naturalist, uh, he had a strong proclivity to sort of um, documenting well everything that he saw. And so what did he see? Uh, he saw lots of fossils. He saw lots of rocks and sort of geologic features. And he saw lots and lots and lots of animals and plants. And from all of these observations, he sort of uh, drew three main uh, conclusions. First, that the earth is really old. And that's based on both the fossils that he saw and sort of the geological features because he had a bit of background in sort of uh, geology and chemistry. Uh, he knew that animals existed in the past that don't exist today. And he also saw that uh, species and animals are highly diverse, even in a very small area. And so he took these three main observations, he sailed back to England, and he sort of sat in his armchair and sort of thought about it for literally decades. And he was trying to come up with a way to think of like how all these pieces fit together, and could he come up with a theory that sort of explained it all in one complete package. What he eventually came up with uh, was his sort of uh, his big contribution, his big famous book, uh, The Origin of Species by Means of Natural Selection, published in 1859. It sort of laid out the theory for the evolution of species by means of natural selection. 
So as I sort of describe this uh, theory, I want to first define what I mean when I say species. Here, I'm going to use a specific definition for this talk, where a species is a group of organisms that share common, common characteristics and can interbreed. Uh, that last part is particularly important in the idea that organisms can breed and make fertile offspring. Uh, so for example, while a horse and a donkey can mate, they'll produce a mule, which is sterile. Thus, uh, based on the, this definition, we would define horses and donkeys under different species because they can't interbreed and make a fertile offspring. So that's the definition of species that I'll use for this talk. Now, uh, a big idea in this uh, theory of natural selection was this idea of, of descent with modification. Uh, that is, Darwin thought that new species come from older species. Uh, this is the only figure uh, in the book, The Origin of Species, uh, where Darwin is trying to illustrate this idea of species branches, uh, where one species can give rise to multiple new species. Uh, so one species can give rise to other species. Those species can give rise to other species. Some will go extinct and others will survive. And those surviving species can though on, go on to make new species and so on and so forth. And so this concept of descent with modification was a way to explain where new species come from. They don't just come out of thin air. Uh, and so uh, with that concept, I'd like to now describe sort of the, um, the, the meat of this theory of natural selection, that is how you actually get species evolving in the first place. Uh, so I'm going to sketch out a little uh, cartoon example uh, to illustrate this. Uh, so let's say we have an island and this island has a population of finches. Uh, and within this population, we sort of need uh, three things to be true in order for natural selection uh, to operate. And so the first thing that we need is uh, variation in a trait. Uh, and so variations are just slight differences in a given trait within a population. Uh, so humans, for example, uh, there's variation in height, there's variation in hair color. Uh, in this example, we have variation in beak size. And so you can have small billed or small beaked birds and large beaked birds within that population. And so you have variation in this trait. Uh, what you next need is that this trait is heritable, by which I mean offspring look like parents for that trait. So here, for example, small build birds will tend to make small build offspring and large build birds will tend to make large build offspring. Uh, the example for humans in height would be tall parents tend to have on average taller children. And so there's a certain degree of heritability in those traits. Sort of uh, the next thing we'll need uh, is limited resources. That is, we need competition. So at any given time, there is not enough food on that island for all of the finches of that population to survive. And so some finches will get enough food to eat and survive and reproduce, and other finches won't get enough food to survive and they won't reproduce because they'll die. And so competition is sort of a key part. Uh, this feeds into, you might've heard this idea of like a survival of the fittest. That's where this competition um, really comes into play. And so if we have these three components, um, I'm next going to describe a scenario on this island where we could potentially force these animals to evolve. So let's say that on this island, we have two different kinds of seeds. We have big seeds and small seeds, um, and big beaked birds are able to eat big seeds and small beaked birds are able to eat small seeds. Uh, if there is sort of an equal number of big seeds and small seeds, uh, everything's fine. Everything's sort of uh, at, at equilibrium at, at a steady state. However, uh, let's say that island undergoes a drought and that drought causes the trees to produce larger seeds instead of smaller seeds. So now we have a sort of skew in that, in that food. Um, what then would we expect to happen to our big beaked and small beaked birds? Uh, what we would have is that the big beaked birds, uh, they can eat the big seeds and so they're fine. Uh, they, can, they can all eat. However, the small beaked birds can only eat the small seeds. And since there are less small seeds, some small beak birds won't get enough food to eat and they'll die. And so when it comes time for everyone to you know, have babies, um, the big beak birds who survived are going to have offspring. And since that trait is heritable, their offspring will also have big, uh, big beaks 
so this is sort of the, the key part. This, this sort of ties together this idea of natural selection. It's a competition over limited resources that gets to determine who reproduces. So in this example, if big beak birds tend to make more big beak birds and big beak birds are surviving better, then you would expect that over time, as the size of seeds on the island gets larger, then the average beak size of finches on an island would also get larger because those big beak birds can eat those bigger seeds, uh, they have more offspring, and so uh, in successive generations you get bigger and bigger beak size getting like selected for would be the phrase. So this is all sort of uh, interesting, but it's not just a sort of a, a cartoon example uh, necessarily uh, in that this actually happened. Um, there were two researchers, Peter and Rosemary Grant, who went down to the Galapagos and for 20 years uh, were capturing finches uh, as pictured here and just measuring their beak sizes. Uh, and as they were doing this study uh, on the island they were, that they were on, uh, there was a drought. And so the drought changed the food availability of, of sort of seeds of different sizes. And they were actually able to observe that indeed the size, average size of beak of the beak in those finches actually changed over time in response to that change in their environment. And so they were able to sort of observe evolution happening in real time. One final note I'd like to make on this point is that thinking about how species, how sort of new species emerge. Uh, in this example, uh, let's say now we have two islands. Uh, one island on the left undergoes a drought, and so we only get big seeds or largely big seeds happening on that island. And on another island, we have, let's say, a rainy season that favors small seeds instead of big seeds. Uh, if we have two populations on those two different islands, uh, and assume that there's the, the birds can't fly between islands, maybe they're super far apart, that over time, that finches on the big seeded island will sort of over time evolve larger and larger beaks and beaks on the small uh, birds on the small seed island will evolve smaller and smaller beaks and so if we sort of let those two islands sort of do their own thing over tens of thousands of years it's possible that those two populations of finches will diverge become different enough to the point where they lose the ability to interbreed. And thus, we would end up having two new species of finches evolving from one ancestral population. Uh, this was something that Darwin actually characterized as he was going through the Galapagos and sort of looking at all the different finches and all the variation of finch species, uh, this sort of idea that you could have one sort of parent species of finches giving rise to a whole bunch of different species idea of descent with modification. Uh, this came about largely as a result of these observations of, of finch variation that he saw. So to summarize this first section, Darwin's big idea was that evolution happens via natural selection and new species arise from older species. Uh, natural selection requires three main things. First, that there is variation in a population for a given trait. Uh, such as beak size and finches. That trait, that variation, that uh, variation in that trait is heritable. Big beak birds have big beak offspring. And finally, that there is competition for limited resources. Uh, some birds will succeed and have offspring. Other birds will die and won't have offspring. And so when you have those three components together, that's when you get evolution by natural selection occurring. So now I'd like to take a, a brief, brief pause for questions uh, before I move into the second uh, part of my talk. Awesome. Uh, thank you so much, Daniel. Um, yeah, if you have any questions, type them in the chat on YouTube or here on Zoom. Um, we do have one question from James on YouTube already. Um, so do all resources have to be uh, in limited supply for evolution to happen or... Uh, that's the question, I suppose. Do all resources. So that, that's a very good point. Uh, it's not necessarily that all the resources need to be limited. Um, I didn't go into it, but uh, obviously animals eat more than one thing. Uh, but what we, what we tend to find is that um, 
evolution acts sort of most strongly on uh, foods that are the most limited. Uh, so say, for example, you have, uh, like, let's say on this island, that there are multiple different uh, kinds of seeds that birds can eat. Um, you don't necessarily need to have a depletion of all of those resources. It could be that there's um, one particular kind of seed that, say, in that drought, all the other seeds die. And so just that one, there's just one type of seed left that evolution acts most strongly on that particular food, if that makes sense. Uh, evolution acts most strongly on the most limited resource. Awesome. And uh, I had a question as well. So is it just food then that is the key driver for evolution in like large animals or are there other major drivers? Yeah, that's a good point. Um, I went over food because it's sort of um, the simplest example to think of. Um, there's also selection that can occur. Um, one that you might have heard of is like sexual selection. That is individuals compete for mates. Um, which are in a way a limited resource uh, because you can't mate with everyone. There are sort of only a limited number of, of um, eligible mates for a certain animal. Uh, and so in some instances, you can get sexual selection, selecting for traits uh, that actually don't really make a lot of sense in terms of they don't have a clear purpose. The great example is uh, peacock feathers. Uh, so peacocks have these you know beautiful, huge plumes, um, but they weigh a ton and they prevent the animals from moving as well. Um, so it's actually pretty costly. Uh, and we think the only reason why those evolved in the first place was because female peacocks really love those big displays and they mate preferentially with those males that have the biggest displays. And so, yeah, you can have selection pressures for things that aren't just food. Um, sexual selection is sort of the, the one that uh, is most well studied. Awesome. Thank you for answering those questions. Um, it doesn't look like we have any others at the moment. Uh, so we'll take uh, maybe about a minute or two break and come back at 6.50 um, just to let our speaker get some water and for everyone, for all this to, information to settle in. All right. Thank you. All right, it's about 6.50 now. Um, you know, settle back into your seats. Uh, Daniel, if you'd like to lead off on part two. Great, thanks, Sebastian. Um, yeah, and so uh, moving into the next part of this uh, talk, uh, now that I've sort of defined uh, evolution and sort of how evolution works by natural selection, uh, talking about sort of how animals, uh, I've sort of uh, briefly uh, sort of hinted at this, um, what forces animals to evolve, uh, in particular, in response to changes in their environments. And so first, I'd like to define uh, a term. Uh, this term is adaptation. Uh, so an adaptation is a feature of an organism that promotes survival and reproduction. Um, sort of thus, that feature is subject to natural selection. Uh, so here, for example, uh, 
those giraffes with slightly longer necks may be able to uh, reach up and grab food uh, better than those with shorter necks. And so those giraffes with slightly longer necks are naturally selected. Uh, would be, that's one particular example. Or polar bears, they live in um, wet, snowy environments. And so uh, if they have white fur, that's an example of an adaptation where that white fur gives them the benefit of being able to camouflage better and therefore possibly hunt better. And so what we often see is that adaptations are driven by changes to the environment. And so what happens when the environment an animal lives in changes slowly? Uh, two things can happen. They can either adapt, uh, for example, in that example of the polar bear, uh, or they fail to adapt and can go extinct. Uh, I need to define what extinction is. And so extinction is just when all the members of a species die out and can no longer reproduce. Uh, as I uh, hinted at, uh, extinction can happen uh, for any number of reasons. Uh, the one we'll be focusing on is uh, climate change, uh, but also uh, especially uh, becoming relevant uh, as I talk in the last section about sort of um, human, human activities, uh, habitat loss, uh, hunting, uh, competition between species um, can all contribute to a species uh, dying out or going extinct. Uh, and so I'd like to first give an example um, of a species uh, that failed to adapt to their changing environment. Um, and so the example I'm focusing on are trilobites. Uh, you may have heard of these, you may not have because they went extinct. Uh, these were ancient creatures that existed over 250 mil million years ago in the oceans of ancient Earth. Uh, now, trilobites had it pretty good at the time and were one of the most abundant organisms on Earth uh, that we know based on just fossil records. Uh, however, all that changed when a series of volcanoes erupted continuously for over 2 million years. These volcanoes released a huge amount of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, uh, which eventually got sucked up into the oceans, leading to ocean acidification. This was such a large, dramatic change that the trilobites along with many other marine species, could not adapt quickly enough to survive and thus went extinct. Uh, this idea of sort of um, very large scale climate change, we'll get into more in the last section of this talk, uh, but I'd just like to uh, briefly mention that you might've heard of ocean acidification uh, before uh, when you might've heard about like, climate change today uh, in that human activity leading to increases of CO2 in the atmosphere, uh, leading to um, acidification of the ocean, uh, death of coral bleaches. And so there's sort of a historical precedent, uh, precedence that's been set. Uh, we know that ocean acidification uh, is an example of a very uh, extreme climate change event that can lead to the extinction of species. So I just want to, to mention that. Uh, and so the trilobites uh, in this example um, are a species that fail to uh, adapt to their changing environments. Uh, what I'd next like to do is go over an example of a species that was able to adapt to their changing environments and survive, that is not go extinct. However, before I do that, I'd like to define uh, another term, a scientific hypothesis, just because what I'm going to talk about is a scientific hypothesis. Uh, a hypothesis is a proposed explanation for why and how things work. Importantly, a hypothesis is supported by evidence and sort of explains that evidence and why we think that evidence sort of looks the way it does. Another important part of a scientific hypothesis is that it needs to be falsifiable. That is, if new evidence comes along, or say a, a new experiment or a new fossil is discovered, um, that that hypothesis can be proven wrong. Um, that way we can sort of, things are not set in stone, we learn as we go, and those hypotheses sort of reflect our understanding of the science and the data at the time. And so when we say a scientific hypothesis, uh, we mean it in a very like specific, very testable way. And so the hypothesis uh, that I'd like to discuss is how we uh, sort of, um, those who study uh, evolutionary biology um, think humans might have evolved. Uh, in particular, how humans might have evolved in response to climate change. 
uh, this might be a really great example of a species that was able to survive climate change. Uh, so the hypothesis I'm about to share with you uh, has been one that's been proposed and studied for decades. Um, however, as I mentioned, with uh, any scientific hypothesis, uh, we could identify a new fossil tomorrow or new evidence tomorrow uh, that falsifies this. And so uh, this is sort of one working hypothesis. There's more than one, but this is one um, that is pretty well supported with the evidence that we have available as of right now. Okay. And so uh, in this, we start with the last common ancestor between humans and chimpanzees. We think this ancestor looked very much like a chimp. Uh, based on ancient climate models, we think that this ancestor lived in dense rainforests in Central Africa and lived off of the abundant fruit trees that grew there. And so um, this, this uh, chimpanzee human common ancestor, which I'll just call an ape for simplicity, uh, these apes were sort of living in this dense rainforest, eating the fruit, everything was honky-dory. However, around 10 to 15 million years ago, the local climate started to change. Uh, in particular, uh, things started to get warmer as a part of this sort of global pattern of ice ages and ice melts uh, that we have occurring uh, over sort of vast periods of time. And so during this uh, period of ice melting, uh, the temperature in Central Africa started to get hotter. And what that did to the local climate was that rather than dense forests with lots of trees, a hotter environment uh, actually discourages those dense forests and instead encourages sort of more patchy forests with sparse trees and sort of grass starting to replace um, a lot of that dense forest. And so uh, what we have uh, before the climate change is that uh, say you have an ape hanging out in this dense forest. Um, in order to eat enough food to survive, uh, it can just eat the food that's in the trees that are around it. And so if it eats all the fruit in one tree, it doesn't have to move very far to go to the next tree to find more fruit. So it can, can stick around in a local area and not move around too much. However, as the climate started to change, and as that dense forest started to become replaced with patchier forest, especially along sort of the edges of that forest, we now have apes that have to move. Once they eat all the food in a region, they'll have to move to the next patch of trees to continue eating fruit. And so we have this um, requirement now that these apes are able to move further distances. If they can't move those further distances, they're going to die out. Now, chimpanzees, we know, don't really get around very much. They only spend a tiny fraction of their day actually on the ground. They spend most of it hanging out in the trees. Uh, and when they do actually uh, move around on the ground, they do so in a very inefficient style known as knuckle walking. Uh, apes do this too. They sort of walk on their, on their front hands, uh, on their knuckles. Uh, and so that's a very slow, inefficient way of getting around. In contrast, uh, there have been many, many, many studies showing that uh, the way humans walk, uh, it's called bipedally, that just means on two legs, uh, is much faster and more efficient for covering longer distances. Uh, if you give a chimpanzee and a human the same amount of calories, a human can go a lot further and get sort of more uh, distance uh, than a chimpanzee can. So it's a, it's a more efficient way of getting around. And so, what we think happened is that uh, a chimpan uh, this chimpanzee-like common ancestor who maybe started out not being very good at moving long distances uh, was forced now to start having to move those longer distances. And so if you have a population of these apes and some of those individuals are better able to move longer distances, then those individuals will be able to do so and survive and produce more offspring. If that ability to travel is heritable, then their offspring will also be able to travel a little bit better. And so sort of with that example of finches, you, um, over time, you might get apes that become better and better able to travel as you get selection um, favoring those individuals who can travel better. <clears throat> 
also similar to the Finch example, if we have sort of at the start, we have dense forests that starts getting patchier along the edges. If you have apes that are hanging out in the middle of the forest where the trees are still dense, you know, they can still get by eating fruit locally. They don't have the same need to move distances because they don't have to versus those apes that are sort of around the edges of the forest where the uh, fruit is more sort of sparsely spread apart, they're forced to move those distances. And so they're forced to adapt. Over tens of thousands, tens of millions of years, as that forest becomes more and more uh, sort of separated, you get patchier and patchier forests along the edges, and then you have a uh, rainforest sort of deep into the forest. Eventually, those two populations of apes could become physically separated and eventually potentially give rise to new species. And so that's what we think happened. We think that over the course of two or three million years, the population that lived along the edges of the rainforest and sparser forests continued to evolve as there continued to be a selection favoring those individuals who could move longer and longer distances. Eventually, this sort of sustained uh, evolutionary pressure, this, this selection for individuals that can move further and further distances led to newer species emerging. Uh, so for example, Australopithecus africanus, uh, you might have heard of this like Lucy fossil that was um, famous a couple decades ago. Uh, this is a really great example uh, that we found uh, where this is a new species that branched off from that human chimp common ancestor uh, that has visible adaptations in its skeleton that would allow it to be better at traveling long distances, particularly in a bipedal way. And so we see uh, fossil evidence to suggest that yes, indeed, there was selection acting to favor individuals who could move those longer distances. And that's sort of um, the main hypothesis here is that that initial climate change that altered the distribution of fruit in the forest is what pushed the human lineage along that track towards um, walking bipedally and sort of being more efficient at moving. Now, uh, that's just walking bipedally. Uh, I don't have the time, uh, but there are many other ways in which we think uh, changing environments impacted how humans evolved. Uh, things like brain size, uh, our teeth and what foods we ate, uh, the evolution of our hands and how we make and use tools um, are all intimately linked with the environments our ancestors evolved within and adapted to. Um, it's a really interesting field. Um, and so uh, with that, I'll just briefly recap uh, this section. Uh, an adaptation is a trait of an animal, such as a, a longer neck or a ability to move long distances, uh, which confers some advantage to that organism. Uh, that advantage means that, that animals with those traits are naturally selected. And eventually that trait, uh, that that particular variation in that trait, say ability to move longer distances, becomes more and more common in that population. And so natural selection is occurring. The pressure to adapt often comes as a result of changes to the environment. When faced with this pressure, animals can either adapt and survive, and survive or sort of go extinct trying. We went over the examples of trilobites who failed to adapt to ocean acidification. And we discussed how climate change on the African savanna may have pushed our distant ancestors to evolve into what we are today. And so I'm happy to take a pause here and answer any questions about this section. Great. So if you have any questions, type them in the chat uh, on YouTube or here on Zoom. Um, uh, while people are writing their questions, I do have one. Um, I guess. So did the trilobites go extinct because they couldn't live in the ocean anymore? Or do you think, or is it the hypothesis that like all their food died off as well? Because uh, we kind of talked about evolution as a food based. Yeah, so it was likely um, in that particular case, a mix of those two. Um, in that the food sources that the trilobites ate, uh, like the plants um, were themselves unable to adapt, or at least some of them, uh, we think failed to adapt to that ocean acidification. Uh, 
Uh, and so by virtue of them dying out, the trilobites that lived off of them also died out. Um, the modern day analogy of like coral bleaching uh, caused by ocean acidification, um, we think, uh, well, is currently and will lead to more extinctions uh, because that coral, um, that coral uh, is a key uh, sort of environment and food source for a number of different organisms. And so you sort of have um, this sort of like cascading effect um, where plant life uh, sort of, yeah, food sources lead to extinction of things that rely on those food sources. Uh, but there's also a part to play of like the animal itself being physiologically unable to adapt to say increase uh, acidity of the water. Uh, but my suspicion is that that would have um, less of an acute effect than their food sources running out. Because it's not like the ocean, at least in the trilobite example, it's not like the ocean rapidly, so rapidly became acidified that it would be like, you know, one month they're okay, one month they're all dead. Um, but the plants probably react in a faster way and die out faster because they're more sensitive to their environment, if that makes sense. Yeah, that does make sense. My plants are very sensitive. Um, uh, we have a question from James again on YouTube. Uh, how do you test the hypothesis about uh, patchy forests? Um, and if I can interpret a bit, maybe it's asking, how do you as a scientist actually test this hypothesis? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, yeah, why do we think that the forest became patchier? Uh, and so uh, it's actually super cool. Um, so we have, uh, we have, we can take like uh, samples of uh, fossils and, and fossilized rock, uh, as well as uh, just samples of, of uh, the earth that's been sort of deposited over millions of years. And so if you dig down far enough, you can get samples of like, this is the state of the soil in uh, uh, the middle of Africa 15 million years ago. And what you can do is you can take that dirt and you can chemically analyze it. Uh, and there are particular uh, isotopes uh, that is, um, atoms that have site differences. Um, there are certain isotopes that we know are markers for uh, different kinds of plants uh, because some plants will have more of one isotope and some plants will have more of another isotope. And so what they can do is they can look in the soil and say, what are the isotopes that I know are associated with like big forests, like big forest trees versus what are the isotopes that are associated with small like shrubs and grasses? And what they find is that uh, around this time period uh, in the middle of Africa, uh, both in that time period, the time period before and the time period after, you see this sort of shift in that isotope distribution from being isotopes that we see a lot in forests versus isotopes that we see a lot in grasslands. And so that is why we think um, that ancient forest eventually became ancient patchier forests and eventually ancient grasslands. It was just based on the sort of um, chemical evidence for different plant life that lived at that time. Yeah, I mean, it, it's a bit complicated, but it's a, it's a pretty, pretty clever way of, of sort of um, building those ancestral climates, uh, the, the, uh, yeah, building up like what we think those local environments were like, what sort of plant life was around in a given region. Awesome. Uh, looks like James clarified a bit too, or I guess maybe expanded on the question. Uh, do you also find the eight fossils at these different soils? Um, or maybe when you look in the, for these like trees, do you also find like the fossils of humans, I guess would be the question. Yeah. Um, so that is one unfortunate thing. Um, and it's sort of uh, a bit biased in that Rainforests are notoriously bad for making fossils uh, just because um, the soil composition, basically there's a lot of, um, there's a lot more plant life. There's a lot more, I guess, like biological activity in rainforests. And so basically it's very fertilizer rich in those rainforests, which is actually very detrimental to fossils in that it breaks them down faster versus grasslands and like drier areas uh, with like less plant life are actually more conducive to fossils being sort of preserved. And so we have a bit of a bias to finding um, like fossil apes uh, that were existing on grasslands. And so uh, we, what we've been able to find is that um, based on isotopic, like 
this isotope soil things that I mentioned, in regions that were patchier forests starting to be replaced with grasslands, we start seeing around six to eight million years ago, we start seeing fossilized uh, apes that look more human than chimp. Like, uh, like that example of that, like Lucy fossil I mentioned, like you start seeing the skeleton look more human-like and particularly looks like it was better able to walk bipedally. And so that's uh, why we think that like, we see those fossils in environments that were patchier and more grassy. And so we think that they evolved in those patchier grassy environments. Unfortunately, we don't have the equivalent uh, fossils to say those apes that stayed in the forest looked like modern day chimps. The only thing that we really have is modern day chimps, um, which is, I guess, in a way, a sort of living fossil because we think that uh, those chimps that, I mean, those apes that stayed in the rainforest uh, eventually gave rise to modern day chimpanzees. Awesome. Uh, James, let us know if this answered your questions. Um, if you have more, there'll be time after the third part. Um, but I'm not seeing any other questions at the moment. So we'll take a couple minute break and resume around 7.14, 7.15. Let our speaker get some water. Um, all right. Thank you so much, Daniel. And we'll, we look forward to part three. All right, Daniel, whenever you're ready to go to kick us off for our last part of our last seminar of this spring series. Um, thank everyone for watching all of these and sticking around. And uh, let's get into part three and see how uh, this correlates to modern day. Great. Uh, thanks. Um, a little uh, auspicious. Uh, <laughs> thanks. Um, and so, yeah, uh, in uh, this last section, um, sort of following up on that idea of uh, changing environments, uh, thinking about uh, when environments change very quickly, uh, rapid climate change, how that can lead to uh, extinctions and sort of thinking about the role that humans can play in this process. Um, and so again, we know uh, we have a lot of evidence in the fossil record uh, for the fact that environments can change gradually over time. That sort of happens naturally. Um, some animals can adapt to these changing environments, uh, and some cannot. Uh, we also know that these changes can happen over very long time scales. Uh, that is millions of years, for example, uh, like that trilobite example I mentioned. Um, however, what happens if you don't have millions of years? Uh, what happens if environment change happens too quickly? Some animals may be able to adapt rapidly, while others may not. Uh, and so, uh, the example that I'd like to talk about uh, of an instance where maybe the environmental change uh, happened a little too quickly, at least for some species, um, is uh, this. That is, uh, at the end of the last major ice age, called the Pleistocene, um, we saw that there are, were a large number of species that went extinct at around the same time. 
uh, we think in response to that sort of um, wholesale warming after the end of that ice age. So collectively, scientists call these the sort of Pleistocene extinctions. Um, the greatest number of extinctions uh, we observed was in sort of North America, these sort of North America, uh, they're called megafauna, basically the, the big mammals. And so as the world warmed at the end of the last ice age, many of the large land mammals in North America went extinct, uh, possibly as they failed to adapt to the changes in temperature, rain, and plant life that was happening around them. Uh, things like woolly mammoths, uh, mastodons, and some species of musox were unable to adapt quickly enough, while others, such as bears, elks, and bisons, were able to survive in their changing surroundings. Uh, however, knowing what factors determine whether a species is capable of adapting is pretty difficult and complex. We're still trying to understand how this process works today as we're sort of watching animals go extinct in real time. And it's even uh, more difficult to try to figure things out on animals that have already gone extinct, especially, you know, uh, hundreds of thousands of years ago. Uh, one interesting uh, note uh, is that it's been suggested that part of the reason why these big mammals uh, disappeared from North America at the end of the Pleistocene is that it coincided with the arrival of ancient humans to the area. Uh, these ancient humans were able to hunt these animals so effectively uh, that we were the ones who pushed them to extinction. Um, there is some evidence to support this hypothesis. Uh, however, um, there's not enough to suggest that humans alone were able to drive these extinctions, but it might've been a combination of human hunting, as well as the rapidly uh, warming environments uh, that might've done it in for some of these ancient beasts. And so uh, that sort of uh, cool note uh, leads me uh, to thinking about um, more recently, how humans have impacted our environments. Uh, and so one term that I'll define here, uh, you might have heard it before, uh, is the Anthropocene. Uh, this is an unofficial uh, term uh, used by some scientists as a sort of a geological period, a, a time in which human activity has had substantial effects on the planet's climate and ecosystems, um, with some suggesting that like this Anthropocene really took off after the Industrial Revolution uh, in the 1800s. Uh, where we start seeing uh, human activity starting to have a really significant impact on the global ecosystem and sort of the global climate. Uh, these substantial effects uh, are manifest in a number of things we do, uh, including habitat destruction, uh, ocean acidification, as I mentioned uh, briefly earlier, uh, and most notably uh, pollution and warming temperatures. Uh, that is sort of concomitant with this wholesale uh, release of greenhouse gases like carbon dioxide, uh, methane, etc. Uh, and so uh, the thinking is that uh, if we know that climate change can push animals, uh, has historically uh, in the distant past pushed some animals to extinction, and we now have a period of very rapid climate change, that we could be settling in for a, a set of extinctions across a large number of species. Um, and so similar to like the Pleistocene extinctions, we could now have an Anthropocene set of extinctions uh, that are sort of uh, driven largely by the actions that we, we have taken and continue to take. Uh, and so, um, of course, there's a lot of uh, interest uh, in the scientific community, or perhaps not so much interest as, a, as an impetus or, or a, a need to really understand how animals might respond to rising temperatures. Uh, in particular, there was a study in 2020 that tried to understand how animals might cope with these changing environments caused by human effects uh, by looking at several hundred species of animals and plants and how their local environments changed over time. Uh, so these researchers took species data from many different uh, sites across the globe and for each site they asked whether using historical data um, a given species was found at that particular site. Uh, then they looked at data available more recently and asked if those animals remained or if they were no longer present. That is, there was a, a local extinction in that one particular, I know, in this one particular grassland in, um, I don't know, a particular part of America. We see all of these birds. We saw all these birds, you know, like 50, 60 years ago, and now all those birds in that region 
no longer exist. And so there was a local extinction in that region would be the example. What they then did was they used climate data available from those same sites across time. And they asked whether the average temperature of those sites, uh, the rainfall or sort of the, the extreme temperatures, that's like the hottest days recorded, uh, if those sort of um, metrics of climate also changed at those sites over time. And then furthermore, once they had these two sets of data, they then put them together and asked if a site changes in these climate variables, do we see that animals at those sites, do they go extinct? Do they go extinct at a greater rate than we would expect? And so what they found was that uh, sites that underwent the largest changes in extreme heat, that is the hottest temperatures experienced in a given year, that those sites tended to be the ones that had the greatest number of extinctions. Um, we know that an important part of climate change is the increase in like extreme weather events, uh, like for example, extreme droughts or extreme uh, rainy seasons. And so this study suggests that some plants and animals um, aren't able to deal with these extreme events and so that's what drives those local extinctions in sites that experience those events. Uh, and so that was one key um, conclusion that they drew is that like, um, rather than sort of uh, average temperatures uh, as being a, a, a large driver of local extinctions, uh, it's actually more so the extreme, uh, that extreme climate change, the, the, the extreme weather events um, that really push uh, animals and plants to extinctions in a particular region. Uh, based on that knowledge, what they then did uh, was they used climate predictions for all of the sites that they had across the world. Uh, they looked at their temperatures in 2020 and, and those other climate variables. Uh, and then they sort of extrapolated out and said, based on you know current climate models about how the climate will change in the coming decades, um, what will be uh, the climate of those sites in 2070. And then furthermore, uh, if we have a particular species that exists at a site in 2020, will that, do we predict that species to go extinct by 2070 based on how we uh, expect the climate to change at that site? Uh, and what they found was that uh, of the 500 species that they studied, between 30 and 50% uh, could go extinct either locally or globally across all their sites uh, by the year 2070. Um, this suggests that indeed, human-induced climate change is happening far too quickly for a pretty substantial chunk or percentage of plants and animals to adapt to. And so um, our activity is sort of forcing those animals to extinction because they just cannot adapt quickly enough to that rapid, both that rapid and that large uh, change in environment. Uh, however, not everything was doom and gloom in that study. Uh, the researchers also considered a scenario in which uh, the Paris Agreement, uh, that is this idea that, uh, you know, if all of the countries of Earth band together, we can limit global warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius, uh, that if you sort of use climate models based on the Paris Agreement uh, by 2070, um, you can sort of limit uh, the predicted rates of extinction to maybe something around 15 degrees Celsius. And so um, extinctions are never a good thing, but this suggests that if we're able to limit the amount of climate change uh, and maybe also limit the rate at which the climate changes, and maybe we can give the natural world, the uh, plants and animals of the world, enough time and breathing room uh, to survive and adapt to uh, the environment that we're changing. Uh, that is if yeah, we just slow down the rate, decrease the um, extreme, the, the amount of like extreme change that the environment uh, undergoes, and maybe we can limit uh, how bad this Anthropocene extinction uh, really is. And so with that, uh, I'd like to recap this last part. Um, extinction is when a species fails to adapt to a changing environment and dies out. Um, as I sort of uh, described throughout this talk, uh, climate change in the past has led to many extinctions. Um, Human-made human climate change uh, may lead to many more, especially given how uh, large and how rapidly it's happening. Um, but 
there's some potential that if we limit uh, how much of this climate change uh, actually comes to fruition, we can limit the degree of extinctions uh, that the, we sort of see on the earth. And so uh, with that, I'd like to thank you all for your time. Uh, and I'm happy to answer um, any further questions that you might have. Great, thank you so much, Daniel. Uh, wonderful talk. Uh, what, uh, if you have any questions for Daniel about any parts of the talk, please feel free to type them in chat. Um, I guess uh, one question I have for you, Daniel, is uh, does extreme cold weather have any effect on uh, the kind of extinction rate of animals in this study? Or was it just mostly just extreme high temperature? Um, that's a good question. They mostly focused on extreme high temperatures. Um, historically in the past, for example, uh, if you got like a, a rapid uh, ice, oh, rapid over you know hundreds of thousands of years, if you got a rapid ice age, um, then we have seen in the past that like uh, lots of animals and plants can't adapt quickly enough, even over that really slow time course uh, to that really um, strong decrease in temperature. Um, so yeah, it's not as though like things only die when it gets too hot. Things can also go extinct when things are too cold. Uh, but in the context of like human induced climate change, uh, they tended to see that the effects were greatest at the sort of hotter end of things. Uh, they didn't see a lot of um, sites that got colder over time. Right. Um, and I'm not seeing any questions in chat, but I do have one for you. Um, what made you want to study this kind of field and these topics? Um, that's a good question. I think it's sort of, um, it was interesting me, uh, to me, especially when I first started studying uh, human evolution, that uh, animals, I mean, particularly humans, um, could sort of evolve in such radical ways in response to what is a pretty radical change. Uh, you know, moving from rainforest to eventually like savannas and grassland is a pretty substantial shift. And I was just struck by how um, some animals are able to adapt um, in pretty remarkable ways. Like in humans, we're able, we evolved to walk on two legs um, to sort of meet that. So I was just sort of struck by like, uh, to, to quote a really cheesy movie, like, uh, what was it, Life Finds a Way, um, that there's sort of this, this built-in ability for organisms if given enough time uh, to adapt pretty remarkably to external changes. And so I thought that that was a really, it's really fascinating to me how that happens and how that all sort of happens sort of naturally by natural selection. It's all just a matter of like what works best. So nature sort of optimizes based on the environment that uh, an organism sort of optimizes for the environment that's in. I thought that was a really sort of romantic idea. Awesome. Uh, I'm seeing some thank yous in chat, but I'm not seeing any more questions. So thank you so much, Daniel, for your time tonight. Uh, thank you to all our viewers, both uh, with us now and over the time that, uh, over the people who watch this later on when it's posted to YouTube. Thank you so much for attending our spring seminar series. Um, and we will return in the fall with more seminars. Um, but yeah, thank you, Daniel. 